today's little adventure has brought us to a beautiful little place in the Cotswolds called Bybury. You may not have heard of Bybury itself, but Bybury is a very famous little village and it's been in Pride and Prejudice, Bridget Jones and one of my favourite, favourite fantasy films of all time called Stardust. And Stardust is about a little village called Wall. And in the movie, you get to see all of the beautiful little cottages which are just behind us here. This row of cottages, what they are now, originally was built as a monastic wool factory. A monastic wool is lamb's wool and back in the day it would show how wealthy you were by what you wore. So the monastic wool, the colours that we most know, we all recognise, were like the cream colours and the brown colours. And they actually symbolised how rich or poor you were because the dye for the wool was so expensive. After the wool factory was here, it actually just became cottages. And that's what we have today. And there are all this row here, they go up the hill also. You can rent the number nine cottage and you can have it for minimum of three nights all of the cottages are owned by the national trust and the residents here actually rent the cottages off the national trust Along with this village being famous for being in movies, what made this little place so famous was a poet by the name of William Morris. And he was born in 1834 and he visited here and he said it is quite possibly one of the most beautiful villages in the whole of England. And I actually quite agree. And so do all the tourists. There are very different numbers of how many tourists come here. Some say 10,000 people come a day. I read something recently that 1.2 million people come here a year. So the poor residents here, they must go stir crazy with everyone trying to make videos and everyone trying to vlog about the place and seeing their house constantly, constantly, constantly over and over on the internet. Bybury actually um, does attract a rather a large amount of Japanese tourists here and this is because the now passed away Emperor Hirohito from Japan he came here on his European tour and when he stayed he stayed in one of the cottages there and that's why so many Japanese tourists come because they want to follow in his footsteps one of the residents who lives in the cottages, once upon a time, she needed some help lifting a big heavy garden ornament out of her, in her front garden. So she went and asked the neighbor and he said, yeah, of course I'll help. And he said he was gone only 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes. <laughs> he left his front door open. And upon his return, he walked into his kitchen and there were four Japanese tourists who were inside they'd taken cups down from the shelf and they were making cups of tea for the family to sit around because they believed 
that the house was a museum. <laughs> it's madness. But I've, I've been looking around thinking, wow, it is so beautiful. And it's only 10 a.m. and there is many, many tourists here. One of the things that you can do here while you're visiting is you can go to the trout farm and you have to pay, I think, nine pounds to get in, three pounds to rent the gear and the trout that you catch, they'll gut it for you and you can take it home. But you then have to pay per kilo in weight for the trout that you actually catch. Anyone who holds a British passport has probably never even paid attention to it. But if you look on the very first page of your passport, you will find a picture of the old cottages, which you just saw earlier. Costing two pounds a bag, you get a bag of fish food. However, as I've got a little friend, let's see if he wants to eat some. Here inside the fish farm, one of the farmers says there are 720,000 fish that live in all of the ponds and three of them are natural ponds and they've been here hundreds and hundreds of years and I thought I would like to tell you because you know how I love myths and stories there is a story about a businessman who came here once with his sons and he was looking for a new wife and he found a lady called Mary. Mary didn't actually want to marry him but her parents said that she should because he had money. Now this businessman, let's just call him Frank, I, can't, I, I couldn't find his name. So Frank and Mary get married. Frank's a businessman, he goes away a lot on business trips. One business trip he was on he actually came back a little early and when he got back he found Mary and his eldest son in a very awkward position so let's just say hiding the purple parsnip <laughs> can I even say that <laughs> he was so enraged by this what he actually did he got his eldest son he threw him into one of the ponds here where he sadly became unalive at the bottom of the pond. Mary was so upset by all of this. She was locked out of the house by this man, Frank or Fred, whatever I said his name was, <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> and he locked her out and the next morning, as it was so cold here, She'd actually died herself of hypothermia. And it is said on winter's mornings that you can still see her ghost walking around the pond, crying, looking for the son who she was in love with. The beautiful swan. So here in Great Britain, swans are very, very, very protected because they are all belong, wherever you find a swan in Britain, they belong. My gosh, look at the trouts and the swans. They actually belong to the king. So in Great Britain, it's illegal to catch one, harm one, kill one, and certainly eat one. The only people who are allowed are the royals and you have to gain permission from the king to do so. And I'm a little bit scared because they're getting a bit close. Now, the myth that a swan can... <laughs> so scared. 
that a swan can break your arm. That is just a myth, but they certainly can bite. As I remember when I was a little boy, one of them attacked me in a field because I was like, look at this swan, and I certainly ran away. Oh, what it's like to be young. For nine pounds, you can come in, they give you a fishing rod, some bait and a basket and a little thing to clonk it on its head. There are wild fish water in here, which you can practice to try and catch. Unfortunately, I haven't caught one yet. It costs about 12 pounds per kilo. I think I'm more nervous than the fish. <laughs> I guess you've always got to seek discomfort. I will not be beaten. I've still got my trusty rod <laughs> with my food. <laughs> They're just not biting, as they say in fishermen's terms. And the little tiddlers, they keep looking, but the big monster one, that's the one I want. But it's just not hungry. I might just have to jump in and get it. <laughs> stop, 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 stop. Okay, uh, I do have to give a trigger warning now because I am about to catch a fish and once you take a fish out of water you know what has to happen to the fish so it is not alive shall we say so um if this isn't your thing and you don't want to watch just skip ahead about 40 seconds or so um I don't want it anymore. <laughs> well, that was certainly an experience. Um, I don't know how people have the patience to sit there for hours and hours, <laughs> um, but some people do. So I caught uh, my fish. I called him Captain Bird's Eye. Um, as you saw, Paul had to do the ending, shall we say. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> That's staying in. <laughs> And then um, one of the fish wranglers or rangers, what, a fish farmer, <laughs> they come along and then they gut him and then £15.75 pence later, so almost 20 US dollars later, he's got no guts, he's in a plastic bag and we're taking him home now to feed to Trevor. You can also, while you're here, rent barbecues so you can cook your own fish. Personally, I think we're just going to end up giving it to Trevor. <laughs> Let's carry on with the tour. This is the old mill house. This is one of the most iconic buildings here. And in the 11th century, it actually was a corn mill. So the wheel, which is no longer in use, spins around and creates the corn into flour. And then in the 16th century, it was turned into a degreasing mill where Again, same principle, the water would turn the wheel, but this was to actually degrease all of the wool which was used to make the monk's robes. It's now currently on sale and it has six bedrooms and it's going for what some would say a whopping 1.3 million pounds. So maybe let's say 1,800,000 US dollars. Doesn't sound cheap, but it actually is for what you get. I think it's six bedrooms, they're all en suite, and it actually comes with a ghost, supposedly. And in the top bedroom window of a night, there is an old lady, and she walks around, and she's seen looking out the window. It could be Mary, who we spoke about earlier, or it could be someone else. This place is beautiful and quite spooky. I don't know if I'd want to be here at night, but I also want to be here at night. I think we need to talk about social media and 
I'm guilty of doing it right now as we're watching this. So tourists come here. It must be frustrating for the locals because they're just constantly having their photographs taken or their houses taken where they live. And we're all tourists. I'm part of the problem now because I'm going to tell you a story about tourism and photography and social media. And I'm guilty of doing the same thing. So there is a man, I don't know if he still lives here. He goes by the name of Mr. Maddox. Now, Mr. Maddox was minding his own business, bought himself a new car. It was just a yellow car, a yellow Corsa. And a man came along one morning before all the tourists so that he could get a photograph of the lovely row of houses without anyone actually being in the photo. So this photographer, I'm gonna say he calls himself a photographer because if he'd framed the picture correctly, he would have noticed. So Mr. Maddox bought a yellow Corsa, parked it outside of his house, no problem. So this photographer, he got home and he was so enraged because this yellow Corsa ruined his photograph. And this is the house and this is where the car actually parked. So this photographer, shall we call him, he put this on the internet. As per usual, people were offended because people were offended because there's a day in the week or there's a cloud in the sky now. And these keyboard warriors, they ripped Mr. Maddox to pieces because of it saying it ruined the photograph. Others took the defense of Mr. Maddox and people came, people vandalized his car. He was constantly getting abuse. Some people here have been threatened by coach drivers, been sworn at by tourists, but this is their home. Tourists shouldn't be doing that. So Mr. Maddox, he got on social media as well. And in solidarity and to, how should we say, support Mr. Maddox, so many yellow cars, they all came down. They parked all along here. They were in the fields, they were everywhere, all supporting Mr. Maddox, as do I, because that photographer, one, he can use Photoshop. Number two, if he was taking the picture correctly, he would have noticed the yellow car in it. And it's bright yellow, you'll see here, it is bright yellow. So, Corsa, the dealers, Vauxhall, they actually came to Mr. Maddox and they said to him, how are you getting on with this car? And he said, it's ruined my life. So, because they felt so sorry for him, they actually gave Mr. Maddox a new silver gray kind of colored car, a new Corsa, and took the yellow one away just so that he could have peace. Now, I think that's absolutely terrible that once again, social media, it's keyboard warriors and then people getting angry over things like that. And if anyone watches this and gets angry by it, be angry because we, the tourists, we are the problem. Mr. Maddox is just trying to live his life. I don't know if he still lives there, but I do feel very sorry for him. And I hope that the photograph that that photographer had is completely ruined. And I hope he gets absolutely zero money for it. I really do. What do you guys think? Write a comment if you think that Mr. Maddox was in the wrong for parking his car outside of his house, which is a tourist attraction, or was the photographer right? Or who, who, who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? You let me know in the comments people have lived here since the iron ages and there's an old fort up on the hills and that is meant to be 1200 bc years old so people have settled here for many a year and what they did to build things you see the buildings all have like this yellowy kind of color and that is cotswold stone and cotswold stone is made of limestone which is from the jurassic period and jurassic period means that once upon a time all of this was actually underwater and limestone is made up of millions and millions and millions of little shells and crustaceans and that's what makes the limestone but the reason that it's this orangey yellow color that's because iron oxide is in the stone so that's what gives it this beautiful yellow color and it's very very expensive and the reason it's so expensive is because everybody wants it well i hope you've enjoyed our little walk around bilbury i hope you've enjoyed the ghost stories the history the beauty of the place it's not that far from london in comparison to how far things away you can get here on public transport it's very difficult 
to get here by public transport. It took us just over an hour to get here. And I would say it's worth coming. It's very busy now. Buses, car after car after car after car after car are all coming along to see this beautiful, famous place. But I, yes, I, I do hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you will share it. I hope that you will like it and leave a comment. Yes, comments are very important. I really do love reading them. So thank you very much. And let me know if you've been here or if you'd like to come yourself. Love you, bye.